Some time back, I ran across a cartoon that shows how I feel today. There's a pastor standing behind his pulpit and he says, my sermon this morning is entitled Divorce and Remarriage Among Christians, but he's dressed in a coat of armor. <laughs> Maybe he feels like people are gonna be shooting arrows at him or something like that. Well, anyway, this is, I, I feel a similar way. Maybe I'm a little bit stronger than he because I'm not dressed in a coat of armor. <laughs> but anyway, I, I sympathize with that. Tony Campolo wrote a book titled 20 Hot Potatoes Christians Are Afraid to Touch. And one of the 20 hot potatoes is the subject of divorce and remarriage. And here's what he says in that chapter. I personally believe that most married couples inevitably come to a time when they wonder why they ever got married in the first place and think that it would be a relief to be free again. There comes that morning when the guy wakes up and looks across the bed to see his wife still asleep, her hair hanging down over her face and her mouth half open and he asks, how did I get into this? Or perhaps she wakes up first to see her unshaven husband with no hair hanging down over his face and she asks, is this what I'm stuck with for the rest of my life? <laughs> Well, you people who are laughing, you're laughing because you've, you've had those kind of thoughts, right? Maybe you remember the comedian Rita Rudner. She once said this, marriages don't last. When I meet a guy, the first question I ask myself is, is this the man I want my children to spend their weekends with? <laughs> well, some experts say that the divorce rate in the church is no different than in the world. And I certainly object to that. And especially I object to that if you compare the divorce rates in the world to the divorce rates in this church. Yeah, sure, we, we've had some divorces, but they, they don't happen anywhere nearly as often as, as they do uh, in the world. I'll tell you about two divorces that took place in this church. Years ago, we had a man here in the church and he got himself a girlfriend and he left his wife and kids to live with his girlfriend. So I went to confront him about that and he did seem to be convicted over it and in a couple of days, he was back with his wife. Okay, pretty good. But then uh, a week or so later, he was back with the girlfriend living with her. I rang her doorbell, asked to speak to her this time and told her uh, not to tamper with a work of God, which was uh, her boyfriend's marriage to his wife. She was not really repentant, however, he was, and he went back a second time to his wife. But then a week or so later, a third time he went back to the girlfriend. And this time, I took one of our deacons in those days, who was Melvin Pauls. I took him along with me and we confronted this man. And sure enough, he goes back to his wife again. And this happened about 10 years times where he left his wife and children to live with his girlfriend and then he'd come back. Eventually, it all finalized that he did divorce his wife and he, he married his girlfriend. So I said to the, the wife, you know, the original wife after all this was over, I said, how were you able to forgive him all those times? Why did you let him walk all over you and the kids instead of just divorcing him? And, and she said, I don't believe in divorce. I'm married for life. And if anyone was gonna kill this marriage, it wasn't going to be me. Here's the second example of divorce in our church. We had a 
man who uh, he too, you know, he had a girlfriend, girlfriends on the side, and he was very abusive verbally to his wife. And I met with this couple many times over the years, and even in front of me, I could see fire in his face as he looked at his wife, and he, he said the most abusive words you can imagine to her right in front of me. And I told him he, he was wrong to do that, and I told her, don't, don't listen to those abusive words, you, you don't deserve that, and, and so forth. This was a very difficult, troubled marriage for years and years and years. Finally, he too divorced his wife and, you know, took up with his, some new girlfriend and so forth. So I, I asked the wife, you know, I've been telling you for several years that you should divorce him and, and not tolerate all this stuff he's been doing, including adultery. And, uh, but, but you never did that, why not? And she said, because when I got married, I made my vows to God and I didn't want to fail God. Yeah, he heaped a lot of guilt on me all those years and I believed him that, that I really was worthless and so forth and I just didn't want to make myself even guiltier under God by getting a divorce. Now, how should a church like ours minister to, to those women and other people who go through divorce? Uh, how can we maintain a strong stance on marriage and at the same time show compassion and understanding to divorced people? What does the Bible say about divorce and remarriage? Well, there is no answer that represents all Christians when it comes to divorce and remarriage. Believers in Christ have always disagreed on divorce and remarriage, even though we all agree that Scripture has the answers. So I'm going to walk you through six different convictions that Christians have about divorce and remarriage. Here's number one. Some say God never permits divorce and remarriage for any reason. And here are two passages where they go to back that up. One is Mark 10, 10 through 12. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Well, that sounds pretty straightforward. And here's a similar verse, Luke 16, 18. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery. And the man who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So the Roman Catholic Church takes this view that God never blesses divorce for any reason and so do some ultra-fundamentalist uh, churches. Here's a book titled The Divorce Myth. And when I first ran across this book, I thought, oh boy, I'm gonna buy this book because uh, I, I assumed that what it would be about is that the author would argue that the myth about divorce, you know, is that it doesn't really solve your problem. You know, people think it's going to solve my problems. It'll open up a wonderful new life. This will be the best thing that ever happened to me if I divorce my spouse. And this guy's going to tell all those kind of people that that is a myth. Divorce doesn't do those things for you. So I started reading the book. And I learned that that's not what the author is getting at at all. According to this author, the myth about divorce is that God sometimes allows it with his blessing. According to this author, God never permits divorce and remarriage for any reason. So that kind of took me by surprise, but I, I, I do know that uh, this is what many uh, people believe. Now, people who take this view tend to set their view in cement. 
If someone disagrees with it, they, they often write the person off, well, sometimes as ungodly, liberal, a heretic. It sounds simple. Those verses we read do come right to the point, but uh, there's still more. And that brings us to interpretation number two. Some say God allows both divorce and remarriage if a partner has committed adultery. Now, in Matthew 5, 31 and 2, Jesus says, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress and anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Well, and then there's another verse, Matthew 19, 9. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. So both of these verses, Matthew 5, 31 and 2, and Matthew 19, 9, both of them say that, that there is an exception when you're getting a divorce. Normally it's wrong, but the exception is adultery. Now here's why that can be the case. If a person commits adultery, again, if, if the person has an intimate relationship with someone other than their husband or wife, they establish a new one flesh bond with this new person, and that automatically breaks the one flesh bond they had with their husband or their wife. Since the one flesh bond is broken, the innocent husband or wife has the right to uh, divorce. Now, the question comes up, is the first group that says God never permits divorce, are they unaware of these verses that we've just read here in Matthew? No, they're not. They usually just plain prefer the Mark and Luke passages over the Matthew passage, but we are not free to do that, to prefer one part of the Bible over another. Uh, we, we have to let them both stand so the question comes up, is the Bible contradicting itself? And we answer, no, the Bible never contradicts itself. So, okay, so how then are we going to reconcile on the one hand the Mark and Luke verses that say whoever marries a divorced person commits adultery and the Matthew verses that say the same thing but then add except for unfaithfulness. Well, here's the way I reconcile those two parts. Mark and Luke are giving us the rule. The rule is, if you divorce your spouse and marry someone else, you're committing adultery. Matthew gives us the exception to the rule. And all four verses, the verses in Mark, passages, Mark and Luke on this side, and the two passages in Matthew on this side, all of them were spoken by Jesus in the Bible. So you've got the rule, and you've got the exception to the rule. Now this is not the only place in the Bible where you see an example of this. Here, here's another example, Hebrews 3, 16 through 19. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry, that's God, for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter, namely the promised land, because of their unbelief. Now, at the beginning, he's talking about all those Moses led out of Egypt. It goes on to say they sinned against God, they disbelieved God, and as a result, they were not able to enter, namely the promised land. But wait a minute. Weren't there two people who did enter the promised land who were in that original generation? Yes, there were. Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb are the exceptions to the rule, and what we have here is the rule that the generation under Moses didn't get to enter the promised land. Is the writer to Hebrews unaware 
of Joshua and Caleb being the exceptions? No, he's not unaware of it at all. This guy is a Bible scholar. But the point is, he's just laying down the rule and not dealing with the exceptions. Now this is what we find in Mark and Luke where it says anyone who marries a divorced person commits adultery. That's the rule, but there, are, there is this exception to the rule, namely marital uh, unfaithfulness. Now, this second interpretation that we're talking about right now, this is mainstream conservative Christianity. I would say that, you know, most of the Bible scholars and so forth in conservative Christianity hold to this second view. And, and I certainly hold to it also. Now it implies that there can be an innocent partner in a divorce. And some people will say, oh, there's never an innocent partner in a divorce. You know, it takes two to tango and they're, they're both wrong if a divorce is going on. I, I firmly disagree with that. And in my pastoral experience, I feel like I've seen many occasions where a divorce took place and there was an innocent partner who tried to make the marriage work and was filled with the Holy Spirit and so forth. But the other person just insisted on getting out. And um, so it brings up the question, is, is one partner unable to do such a bad thing as get a divorce unless he's triggered by the sin of, of his partner? Does, does the innocent person have to trigger the other? And, and the answer is no. You never have to trigger anybody else to commit sin. And the proof of this is our relationship with God. We sin against God. Does that mean it's his, he triggered us, he did something bad to us that made us do something bad to him? Of course not, God never sinned. We would never blame God, and that's why uh, that same principle can apply in a marriage too, where there really is no fault on, on the other person. And this does justice to Matthew 5, 31 and 32 and 19, 9, which we've already read, the exceptions to the rule. Now, Jesus doesn't say here that the innocent party must divorce. He says, you may divorce if your spouse is unfaithful. Now, the prophet Hosea had a wife named Gomer who was unfaithful to him and even went off and practiced prostitution, but he forgave her and took her back. And if you also want to forgive your partner for his or her adultery and continue the marriage, God bless you. Good for you. But still, if your partner has committed adultery, you can divorce and remarry with God's blessing. According to this second view, which happens to be my view. All right, here's interpretation number three. Some say God allows divorce on the grounds of adultery, but he does not allow remarriage. Now this strikes me as a compromise between interpretation one and interpretation two that we've already looked at. It's like saying, well, we'll go halfway on the exception to the rule. We'll give you the divorce with God's blessing, but, but not the remarriage. But in the Bible, the right to divorce implies the right to remarry. A divorce on biblical grounds means the marriage is no longer binding and the former spouse is no longer a spouse. And so people divorced on biblical grounds are single, unmarried, and so eligible to remarry someone else. This view, in my opinion, sends the message that those who do remarry are committing adultery. But the guilty partner in the original marriage has already broken the marriage bond by the adultery, and so the innocent person is not bound. Now, put your thinking caps on for this one. I, I know this is kind of a heavy duty sermon here today, but anyway, take the case of the guilty Christian who commits adultery, 
gets divorced by the spouse and then remarries, the, the, the guilty person marries. Are they living in perpetual adultery? And the answer is no. No, they're not. His sin was in the adultery that caused the divorce of his first marriage. Uh, that's where the sin occurred. He, he's not living for the rest of his life in adultery, married to this new person. All right, number four. Here's viewpoint number four. Some say if a Christian is married to a non-Christian and the non-Christian divorces the Christian, the Christian is free to remarry. Now, this too, I agree with. I think that this is exactly what 1 Corinthians 7, 13 and 15 are talking about. Can we put those verses up? Do we have those? There it is. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. So Christian wife, non-Christian husband, don't divorce him. And then verse 15 says, but if the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. A believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. So in the context here, Paul is telling the Christian spouses not to divorce their non-Christian spouses. But here, the non-Christian initiates the divorce and ends the marriage. And the point is, the Christian is uh, not obligated to make him stay. He says there in verse 15, but if the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. And it goes right on to say that the Christian partner is not bound. So if you're not bound to your former marriage partner, you are obviously, in my viewpoint, free to remarry. Now some people say that the deserted Christian should not remarry. But that takes us back to viewpoint number three where, you know, we'll go halfway, you can divorce but don't remarry. And the idea doesn't really do justice to the text. All right, now we're on to interpretation number five. Some say if a non-Christian has been divorced, even on unbiblical grounds, and then becomes a Christian, he has the right to remarry. Well, you know, I agree with this too. This is my viewpoint again. And 2 Corinthians 5.17, I believe, reinforces this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. The point here is that we cannot hold a non-Christian's past against him once he comes to Christ. Nor can we expect non-Christians to live up to God's standards in the Bible. Here's an article I cut out of the Fresno Bee newspaper. And it's an article about the annual meeting of the Assemblies of God denomination. And it says, delegates of the Assemblies of God have defeated a resolution that would have allowed divorced and remarried pastors if the breakup and remarriage took place before they accepted Christ. Now see, what the Assemblies of God turned down, and they turned it down by three, 1,365 votes against it and 895 votes for it by the delegates. So, you know, so they, they weren't totally united in their belief about this thing. Uh, you know, if I had been able to vote, my vote would not have won the day. I would have been in the minority there. So anyway, what I'm saying here in point number five, the Assemblies of God said, no, we're, we're not going to go that far. But in my opinion, they really should go that far. All right, now number six, and this is the final one. Some say God allows divorce and remarriage for many reasons. They say things like God's grace covers every sin. Well, that's true. Yes, it's true. But it's still a sin if you divorce and or remarry on non-biblical grounds. 
This group says it's not a sin to divorce if you're on separate paths in life, you no longer love each other, or you found somebody new. Remember William Bennett? He was the former United States drug czar. Well, here, here is another clipping I took out of the Fresno Bee newspaper. It tells this story about him and his wife. They, they went to a wedding and as they're driving to the wedding, William Bennett says to his wife, have we got the, the wedding gift? And she says, no, I thought you bought it. He says, well, I thought you bought it. And so they're horrified, oh, we don't have a wedding gift to give. Well, so they go to the wedding, and in the wedding, the wedding vows say, instead of as long as we both shall live, the wedding vows say, as long as love shall last. And that disgusted. William Bennett, and so he says here in this story, he says, so I went home and I sent them our wedding gift, and our wedding gift was paper plates. <laughs> okay. And then there's the woman who divorced her husband, and she was afraid her pastor wouldn't approve of that, but she went to her pastor and said, Pastor, I've divorced my husband, and I just want you to know I did it because of what the Bible says. The pastor said, oh yeah, well, what passage is that? And she said, Ephesians 4.22, and then she quoted it, put off the old man with his corrupt ways. <laughs> Well, that's not really what Ephesians 4.22 is, is, is getting at, when, but th that's the one uh, she used. And then there's the woman who said, when I got married, I was looking for the ideal. And then our marriage became an ordeal. So now I'm looking for a new deal. <laughs> and then there was the... Uh, a uh, woman who went to her, her lawyer, she said uh, to him, she said, I came to ask you a question. Uh, do I have grounds for divorce? And the lawyer said, are you married? <laughs> yes, you have grounds for divorce. <laughs> well, that's, that's how easy it is sometimes. Here is a commentary on the Gospel of Mark by Kent Hughes, and he quotes authors John Adam and Nancy Williamson, who wrote a book titled Divorce, How and When to Let Go. Sounds like a pretty good title. Now, he quotes them in their book, and I just want you to know that Kent Hughes is, is not agreeing with them. He's just kind of showing you where the world is these days, and that's the reason I'm quoting this too. So listen to this quotation out of this book, Divorce, How and When to Let Go. They say, your marriage can wear out. People change their values and lifestyles. People want to experience new things. Change is part of life. Change and personal growth are traits for you to be proud of indicative of a vital, searching mind. You must accept the reality that in today's multifaceted world, it is especially easy for two persons to grow apart. Letting go of your marriage, if it is no longer fulfilling, can be the most successful thing you have ever done. Getting a divorce can be positive, problem-solving, growth-oriented step, it can be a personal triumph. Wow. So there's the whole idea of just, you don't even have to have a reason. Just go ahead and get a divorce and, and, and God, God will, will still bless you. Well, it, this whole step sounds like there's no such thing as sin anymore. And that just goes way too far. I, I can't buy into this number six at all. Okay, now, I'm going to sum up here, and I'm going to say that there are three ways a Christian can divorce and remarry with God's blessing. Now, before I tell you these three ways, I just want to say, these are the three conclusions to which I have come. 
But I've already told you that not all Christians agree. Uh, uh, just, just, just because these are my convictions doesn't mean that godly people will never disagree with me. Maybe they will, and maybe you will. But the, these are the convictions that your pastor has. And number one, if your partner commits adultery. Number two, if your non-Christian partner deserts and divorces you. And number three, if the divorce took place before you came to Christ. In all those cases, you can uh, divorce and remarry with God, or at least remarry there uh, with God's blessing. May still have been a, a sin to get the divorce before you came to Christ. All right, now for my action steps. I have three action steps. Three things, three ways I suggest for us to respond to this study today. Number one, if you have not gone through a divorce, don't be proud of it. As a pastor, I believe that many divorced people worked on their marriages harder than many people whose marriages lasted until death. And if you're tempted to judge a divorced person, what you're, all you need to really say is there, but for the grace of God, go I. Here's the second action step. If you have gone through a divorce, forgive yourself. And you may not even need forgiveness because you were the innocent party of unfaithfulness. Now, we have had many people in this church over the years serve on our leadership boards who have been divorced. We believe in the grace of God and we rejoice in the forgiveness of God. Now, here's a fascinating story that happened to one of the, the men in our church, okay? This man, his parents divorced and they both married somebody else. Now, when this man's parents were married, they had several children, including this man in our church and a couple of others. So then they both divorced and they both remarried and then they had other children too. And then years and years and years later, the two original husband and wife they were still married to somebody else, both of them, but they called a, a family meeting of the original children and the original husband and wife parents. And when they all got together, this father and mother of, of their original children in their original marriage, they said, we just want to say to all of you kids that uh, we were wrong to divorce and we want you to forgive us for breaking up your family and, and for doing this to you. This was wrong on our part. And you know, that was an incredibly powerful day for, for, for that family to be able to do that. I, I think that was a very gutsy thing. And then the third action step here is this. We, the church family of divorced people, must let them serve. I was talking to a woman who goes to another church, and she told me that when she got divorced, the church leaders and so forth told her, well, you know, we know that you serve, but we're gonna have to, you know, put you on the sidelines uh, for now. And she said, you know, I never got off the sidelines. And she even said to me, I would have been better off if I had murdered my husband. The church would have forgiven me for murder, but they never forgave me for divorce. They never let me serve ag again. Well, <clears throat> this church here, First Baptist Dinuba, is willing and eager to forgive you and use you. And we need to remember that people going through a divorce, they're suffering 
Many times they feel worthless because the person they love the most in all the world left them behind. They feel like they can't do anything right because that's what their spouse told them for years. They can't imagine a nice future for them and for their children. They need friends. And we are the people they need. We are the friends they need. And if not for the grace of God, we who maybe have never been divorced could have been divorced. Being the same kind of husband and wife we, we were anyway. And so we, we do need to let these people serve. Well, okay, thanks for hanging in there with me. Uh, I know this was kind of a heady thing this morning, but uh, in this series on marriage and family, I felt like I really needed to address this. Now let's pray. Lord, help us to sort all these things through. And thank you for your grace in Christ. Thank you for your forgiveness of all our sin. We, we are all sinners. And uh, we just pray that we can glorify you, Lord, in our lives and in our marriages, that Jesus might be lifted up. And we pray this in his name. Amen.